Welcome to Caregiver Cast with Mary Elaine Petrucci. Are you overwhelmed raising a family, working full time, caring for a parent or grandparent? It can be challenging when you're doing it alone. Caregiver Cast helps busy, burned out professionals reduce their stress and overwhelm to create a better caregiving experience for themselves and their loved ones. Caregiver Cast brings caregivers together with experts who provide information in a variety of areas. In each episode, you'll get tips on topics such as finance, legal, medical, self care, community resources, mindset, and more. We're here to make your caregiving journey a more rewarding one. Acquire the confidence and skills to be a more capable caregiver by implementing the resources and strategies from these expert thought leaders. Get a community of support, resources, and strategies for your caregiving journey inside the Caregiver Lifeline community. Visit caregiverlifelinecommunity.com. And now here's your host, Mary Elaine Petrucci. Hi, welcome to Caregiver Cast. My name is Mary Elaine Petrucci, your host. My guest today is Debbie Compton, who will be talking to us about briefcase to bedside. Before I formally introduce Debbie to you, I'm just going to give you some background information about her. Debbie is a three-time primary caregiver for parents with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and currently with vascular dementia. She has been a community educator for the Alzheimer's Association since 2017, and she is a certified caregiving consultant and a certified caregiver advocate. Debbie has authored nine books and counting, geared to readers young and old and everyone in between. Every book was written to support a family member or a caregiver. In her book, Caregiving, How to Hold On While Letting Go, Debbie shares her knowledge, strategies, and tools she created to make life easier and safer. Just as important, she says, is taking a few moments each day to appreciate the ability still present, the laughter, the silly faces, and tender hugs that require no speech yet are universally understood. Debbie got her formal training from after two of her parents passed away. There was no time when you're caring for three people. She learned so many lessons the hard way and has given her and it has given her a heart of compassion and empathy for caregivers everywhere. She wants them to have a less stressful journey and to spend minutes instead of years learning the valuable information. Debbie founded the Purple Vine, whose mission is to empower caregivers to reduce stress, block burnout, and laugh again. On her website, you'll find an informative blog inspiration, resources, laughter, and an email list you can join. Private consultations via Zoom are offered at very reasonable rates. In them, Debbie listens, understands, offers resources, systems, and strategies to cut years off your learning curve. Welcome to Caregiver Cast, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Mary Elaine. I appreciate it. Give us an idea of your caregiving journeys with your parents um, and their diagnosis, I guess, of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Can you give us some idea of how that all transpired? Sure. Um, well, I was working a retail management job, traveling coast to coast mm. and uh, managing teams nationwide. And so I didn't really realize what was ahead. Uh, my dad had been diagnosed with Parkinson's. My mother had not been properly diagnosed, but we knew that she had some form of dementia, but she was very high functioning. So I had them going to the daily living center through the day, and I would do the pills at the beginning of the week and sort them all out and have them in their boxes. And And I was naive enough to think that, okay, you know, problem solved, everything's fine. And did not understand how the diseases work and that they get progressively worse and they do not get better. And so there was just so much um, that I learned quickly, had to learn very quickly in the process. So um, 
like I said, dad had Parkinson's, um, my mom with vascular dementia, and then my mother-in-law then later got um, Alzheimer's. So got experience all the way around. <laughs> yes, you did. And all at once, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, so what did you, did you plan and feel prepared then as a caregiver? Or did you have any idea of what you needed at the time? When you no. were your parents? No, not a clue. I didn't, I didn't even know what questions I needed to ask. Mm -hmm. And it, it seemed to just catch me completely off guard, even though I knew these diagnoses were there. I didn't realize that the other issues that you would be facing because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we live in a logical world and dementia is not logical. And no, uh, right. And so normal things you can prepare for. And when you're raising children, I'm thinking, oh, it's a, you know, about the same thing. It's not, it's not even close. <laughs> so, it really isn't. Um, you no. Get, yes. Okay. No, you run, you deal with the bazaar every day. And Thank so, you. You did yeah. It. So you just, it, it's hard to be prepared. I could have been much better prepared. Um, which is why that's my whole mission now is to make sure that other caregivers are more prepared than I was, because it's very difficult when you're suddenly in the trenches with all these different dementias going on and all these different things happening at once. And everyone's looking to you to come up with solutions and solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was just researching 24 seven, trying to <laughs> seem like, you know, trying to learn about the diseases. And that's what I would really stress with caregivers is the very first step is learn about the disease, mm -hmm. learn everything that you can, yes. and then it'll really help you again and again, knowing down the line. And uh, in, in my first book, that's what I talk about too, are steps and stages of the disease, because I didn't even know that. But then the more important part is how do you deal with it? What do I do when I'm faced with these problems? And so I address all those too and give very practical things that you can try. And I say try, because as you know, one solution doesn't fit everyone and it might fit this morning and not this afternoon. And so, <laughs> so it's ever changing. Definitely. Um, and of course, there's always something that isn't in your book or yes, in any manual anywhere. Um, yes. So you are always, like you said, um, dealing with the unknown and yes, um, trying to determine what the best course of action is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did you also feel like you... Um, were prepared in the sense of having like all the medical and legal documents and all of that in place? Or was that something that you had to do ASAP, basically? I had, um, I had the power of attorneys uh, put in place for my parents. So I was prepared for them. What I was not prepared for was my mother-in-law, who has five children. And I didn't expect to be to be her caregiver and I was not her power of attorney and that made it very challenging to be able to because she lived with us the last year of her life and oh so it's yeah so it was a real challenge in taking care of things when I didn't have the authority to take care of a lot of things and yeah lessons learned I, I learned them the hard way <laughs> Sounds like you did. So uh -huh. did you have to go through different, um, with your mother-in-law, you had to go through different like uh, children in order to yes. get a response about how and best to deal with a certain situation? Her, yes, her daughter was power of attorney and her daughter controlled her bank account and everything. Mm -hmm. And so when I would go to pick up medications, even it wasn't a simple process. And, you know, so, so everything was a lot more difficult in that situation, mm. but, you know, it, it was just, and, and it was really eye opening too, because Alzheimer's affected her so much differently than it did, than dementia did with my mom. Um, because it completely, as, as so often happens, Alzheimer's can flip the personality and all of a sudden you're dealing with a lot of 
anger, a lot of emotion, and this sweet, precious, kind, loving little woman is throwing things at me and cussing. And I'm like, who am I dealing with? And it was that was very hard for the family to understand because that's not their mom. And their mom did not behave that way. So they just couldn't understand until they come and be around us for a while and see it for themselves. And then you understand. Right. You should videotape it then too, so that you can definitely show that this is, yes, the person is now responding to things. Right. Because they don't understand it. It's too bizarre. It's too out of character. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. And they just, they could not understand. I wound up taking more drastic measures than that. Even um, I, I had, I was in total caregiver burnout. I didn't know it because I didn't know what that term even meant at that time. But uh, I do know now I was totally, yeah, I was totally burned out. I was totally exhausted emotionally, mentally, physically, everything. And didn't feel like I was getting, well, I wasn't getting support. (laughs) And so, so um, I booked a trip to go see my son in North Carolina. I live in Oklahoma. And so I fixed a manual up and listed all the medications and the contacts and the likes and dislikes on food and everything, activities and movies and the whole bit Mm -hmm. and made up a schedule, a rotation schedule and said, here you go. You have her first for three days and then you're taking her over here for three days and then you're taking her there for three days. And it was a great awakening for the family. (laughs) They had no clue until they went through that. And then they would call me and they're like, you'll never believe what mom did. And I said, yeah, she does that all the time. They're like, well, I can't even get any sleep. I know. (laughs) Welcome to my world. Exactly. What is sleep? (laughs) Really? At that point? Yeah. Wow. That's amazing that A, they even took her. I didn't ask. I just, I just took her and dropped her off and said this is the plan and then I left (laughs) wow it was bad I was I was at the end of my rope I couldn't go anymore I couldn't function and I had to do something I had to do something to get their attention and to make them understand Mm -hmm. what I was dealing with yes that is very extreme but kudos to you for doing it and having the family step in and see what it was like for you um so what was their the family's response once you came back to reclaim your mother-in-law <laughs> well it's funny uh, my husband picked me up at the airport and as we pulled into my driveway they were already parked in the driveway with her waiting for me to get home are you serious <laughs> i'm totally serious yep <laughs> they were like, oh okay. my gosh yeah, my three days is done, you know, here you go. <laughs> but I will say there was a lot more compassion after that. There was a lot more, mm. um, you know, uh, just support, just, you know, well wishes and things like that, which meant the world to me. It meant the world to me that someone understood, you know, or that they appreciated what I was doing on behalf of their mom. Well, yes. I mean, so how long were you taking care of her before you um, showed up with their mother on their doorstep? Probably about, about eight months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So when were you still working at this point? No, I, nope. I uh, couldn't, I realized pretty quick because I was in, I was on the East coast when my dad accidentally took my mom's pills and he had low blood pressure. She had high blood pressure. So he was nearly comatose in the hospital. And so I had to immediately rush back and stuff. And then I was on the other coast when my mom passed out at the daily living center, she started having blood pressure fluctuations. And so then she had to be rushed to the hospital. And so then the third straw was I was in Colorado when my little mother-in-law locked herself out of her house in the middle of a snowstorm. And she didn't have the mental clarity to walk next door to the neighbors to, that she'd known for 40 years. Instead, she got in her car and sat in her car until her daughter got off work. I, we don't know how long, you know, five to eight hours later. 
Right. Um, so right. we were very fortunate that she didn't die at that point in time. And uh, so I think a lot of times families go through denial Mm -hmm. And they, and I know I did too. I'm like, oh, they're okay. You know, it's, it's not a big deal until those events happened. And then it was like, okay, changes have to be made. They are not safe. Someone has to step up and take care of them. And then it wound up being me. So <laughs> well, I can understand for your parents, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did you become the caregiver for your mother-in-law especially if her daughter found her sitting in the car. Yeah, that, well, she lived with her daughter and her daughter was working really long hours and her daughter could not seem to grasp the condition of Alzheimer's mm. and could not, uh, like she would write, write notes for my mother-in-law to follow. Well, that works in the beginning, but it doesn't work very quickly. That goes away. Mm -hmm. And so she'd get really frustrated at her mom because her mom couldn't remember things and couldn't remember how to do the laundry, couldn't remember how to operate the microwave. And I'd tell her over the phone, this is the disease. This is the way it is. She's not doing it on purpose. Right. This, this She can't help it. And she didn't seem to be able to grasp that. So they would call us fighting with each other all the time. And mm -hmm. so it was finally like, you know what? You might as well just bring her here let her stay with us because this is exhausting too. And you, <laughs> yes, I can imagine. <laughs> and then it must be very frustrating when somebody doesn't understand what is mm -hmm. the disease itself and then it's progression. Yeah. That must've been. Very. Yeah. Very frustrating. And I'm sure you were called in the middle of the night too. So I'm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what made you decide to write your first book caregiving how to hold on while letting go i love the title thank because, you um it reminds me of my mother who had alzheimer's and toward the end she was unable to communicate mm -hmm. um, she also had parkinson's so she really couldn't walk mm -hmm. and that was like her favorite activity so mm -hmm. um yeah you have to hold on while you have to, you do, you do. And you've got to try to hold on to your sanity while you're dealing with all this insane behavior. Mm -hmm. And it, it works on so many different levels. And so that's why I did that. But I, I didn't set out to write a book. I was just trying to survive. Um, mm -hmm. My dad at that point had passed away from Parkinson's. His battle was only seven years from beginning to end. And then he was gone. Uh, my mom was the very first one diagnosed and the very last one to pass away. And she actually just passed away three weeks ago. Oh, so, my... yeah, for that. thank you. Thank you. It was, it was tough, but even though you know, it's coming, you can never be ready. Um, but my mother-in-law was in our home passing away and I had brought in uh, hospice much too late because I didn't know better again. And, but I had hospice in and they were helping and the little hospice nurse saw some of the things that my husband and I had created and we had a bed alert system and stuff. And she said, she said, where did you read about that? And I kind of laughed and I said, we didn't read about it. We created it because the things that were out there available did not work for us. And she said, huh? And she says, well, what, what's happening here with the door? So I was explaining to her because my mother-in-law was just like a little escape artist. I mean, between two and 4 a.m. particularly, uh -huh. She would be out the front door and just gone. She's the little lady who could barely walk would be moving just as fast as her little legs could go down the street. One time, totally nude at 2 a.m. at that time. <laughs> and I about died. But I thought, well, thank heaven. All my neighbors are asleep. <laughs> wow. So, so we, you know, we tried the things that they recommend and the latch up high. Then she pushed a chair over and climbed up on the chair. That's a good way to break a hip. So that was not going to work for us. So we kept trying different things. And then we finally created our own little way to keep the door shut and stuff and keep her safe inside. And so the hospice nurse was asking about these things. And um, she said, you know, other caregivers really need to know about this stuff. Mm. And for the first time, I was shocked because I figured I'm the last one to the party. I'm the one who doesn't understand how things are working. Everybody else has it figured out. 
you know, it's just me that's trying to survive here. And it's crazy, but you know, a lot of caregivers feel that way. And I have come to discover that many caregivers feel that way because it's so isolating and you're by yourself and yeah. you're trying to deal with all this stuff and you, you feel like you're the one who just can't figure anything out. And that's just not true. Yeah. So when the hospice nurse said that, that really hit a chord in my heart because I don't want other people to go through what I went through and mm -hmm. I don't want them to have to learn things the hard way like I did. And, you know, and so that that's when I prayed about that over the night and I woke up the next morning and I knew, OK, I've got to write a book. Mm -hmm. And so I I put the information in the book, everything that I knew to that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then I then I had the time to get certified and get my certified <laughs> caregiving consultant and certified caregiver advocate. And I learned so much that would have been great had I known previously. <laughs> but you don't know what you don't know. So, so that's why I wrote the book though, because of a hospice nurse. Well, it was a great suggestion because um, it, you're right. The caregivers don't know what to expect a lot of times and mm -hmm. they just don't have time to really search the internet for information because mm -hmm. who knows what, if that's really good information or not. Right. Wow. Right. And so many things like when dad was having hallucinations and I did the research, well, all I could find was don't argue with him. Okay. That's a good starting point, but that was not enough information because I wanted to know, I come from a training and development background and, and right. so I'm used to a linear process. You do one, two, three, and you get four. I quickly discovered dementia is not like that. You do one, two, three, you might get seven, 12, 102 you don't know it's just right. all over the board and uh and so that's why you know I wanted to not only understand what was going on in his brain which I could find that but I wanted to know how do I deal with it how mm -hmm. can I prevent it from happening again you know how can I at least minimize this occurrence and that stuff I couldn't find and and so that's what I share with people now is actionable steps, information, you know, try this, try this, try this, and uh, to help them get through it, because theory doesn't work when you're dealing with just this behavior that you don't know how to handle. You need action steps. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. I, I would agree with that. Um, just briefly, just let's go back to, to the title of your book. Mm -hmm. What was the impetus for that, um, how to hold on while letting go? Mainly what I was thinking about was that I'm trying to hold on to my sanity while I'm trying to let go of my loved one. And I'm losing that relationship, which that was really, that was the hardest with my mom mm -hmm. because she had such a long struggle. I mean, she had vascular dementia for 22 years. Whoa. And Yes. First one diagnosed, last one to pass away. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so it was, it was a long, long journey, but uh, she was very high functioning for a long time. And even up until um, just like, to, oh, it was only a, a few days before she went into a coma. She was still walking slowly, very, very slowly, but she was still able to walk. Wow. So, so she was high functioning for a very long time. We were super blessed in that. And she kept her sweet personality. And so that made it easier too. But even when um, she couldn't speak anymore, mm -hmm. I would lower myself down to get eye level with her and then make funny faces at her. And she would make a funny face back at me and we'd both just laugh. And so that's what that is alluding to in the intro there is that even if you don't have laughter, I mean, even if you don't have words to communicate, you can still find joy. You can still find laughter in the journey. And that's what I really try to help caregivers do is to lighten up, you know, let go of perfectionism. Forget oh, it. Yeah, for it's, sure. That's yeah, for, just forget that. And then laugh. Every time you, you can. I mean, I I did some of the craziest stuff. I took my mother-in-law and my mom 
vascular dementia and Alzheimer's. I took them both to the beauty shop to get their nails done, to the doctor, and some crazy stuff happened, you know. <laughs> but it's it's okay. You, that's why you gotta. That's why you have to laugh about it, you know. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you. Uh, my mother went to an adult daycare center, mm -hmm. and um, red was her favorite color, and she came. My home mom's too. Really? Yeah. Got a lot in common. Um, yeah. So she came, she comes home from the adult daycare center and her fingernails are kind of like a peachy color. And I mm -hmm. was like, oh, that's really odd because it's, you know, not her favorite color. So, but then I realized it, it matched her shirt. Oh. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, now I get it. Now <laughs> I get it. Yes. A little slow on the uptake, but yes. Um, yeah, just having oh. her just be there twice a week and just be with her peers and things was really helpful for like the caregivers, yes. and my father. And it, I think, um, you know, I, I think she understood that, you know, I ended up going to court two days before Christmas attempting to get guardianship because my father was in denial oh. that she had oh. Alzheimer's. Yeah, so after two major falls and breaking her mm. her uh, collarbone and then her hip, her pelvis, oh my. yes, um, I asked dad oh. to put mom on a memory care unit. Mm -hmm. Initially, he was taking, dad was taking mom home without me knowing it. Oh, no. And then he had a friend make the steep ramp outside the front door. So if mom attempted to go down that with her walker... Or was oh. secured in a wheelchair, it would have been all over. It would have been it. Oh, mm -hmm. um, oh my goodness. So I just said, so I'd go to work, not knowing mm -hmm. I was going to get that phone call saying one or both of them were seriously injured or killed. So how terrible. Was, yeah. It was not that is, it is so hard. And you know, on that too, I, um, I cared for dad in his home till he passed of Parkinson's. That's what he wanted to do was stay in his home. He only lived three miles from me. So I would just travel over there to honor his wishes. And then my mother-in-law um, passed here in my home and my mom, I had to put into a memory care and it broke my heart. I felt like I was letting her down. I just, I cried. I was so upset, but she was passing out again and she outweighed me by 35 pounds. And so the doctor made the call for me and he's like, this is not safe. She needs to go into memory care. So while I felt like I was letting her down, she blossomed. She loved it. She had friends to be around. She had activities going on. She's always been a people person. Mm -hmm. And it was only at that point that I realized, you know, she might've been a little bit bored with just me and her because yes. I love to garden. She likes to watch movies, you know, <laughs> it's different. And so it, it was a good thing for her. So caregivers, that's the, the message in that is that if you, sometimes the best thing that you can do is to put them in a facility where they can be taken care of, because then again, I got to be her daughter. I didn't have to be that mean person who was making her take her medicine and making her eat her food and yes. making her take a bath. I got to enjoy the relationship so much more. So mm -hmm. it, it turned out to be a good thing. It does in your case. Um, we did finally get mom home on May 22nd, their uh, 58th wedding anniversary. So we did get mom home. Mm. I did get her home with 24-7 care. So mm -hmm. I kept my promise to my mother um, mm -hmm. because they both had to, the judge deemed that both my parents had to undergo a neuropsychological evaluation by two separate neuropsychologists. And, um, we already, I already knew anyhow, um, how mm -hmm. impaired mom was, but then to see that dad would not have been a good caregiver for mom, um, mm. was pretty eye opening. And I think, I think that probably hurt my father in some way, because even though he was trying to do right by her, he wasn't right. Right. Well, and that's what we don't understand sometimes because we think that we know what's best for them. And sometimes we don't. And that was my case. I thought that the best thing for mom was to keep her here with me. And that was not the best case. She needed to be around people and activities and, 
she needed to be able to wander the halls and see different things going on. And that's, that was better for her. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Definitely. Um, everything works out for the best though. I think that's the most yes. important thing to remember. Yes. Um, so what made you get certified um, as a caregiving consultant and now as an advocate? And what does that mean for your help to caregivers? Well, what that means is that I am odd. <laughs> I am, oh, I am Debbie. one of the, Ooh. I am, I am. And, I, and you know what? I embrace that. Um, who wants to be average? Uh, um, most people have one perspective uh, that they come from to help someone with. I have a wide variety. Um, and so what that means is that I went and I got this training and I learned better ways that I could have done things for the two who had passed away, but I learned beneficial things to make my mom's last years have much more quality of life. Awesome. And so it, it was wonderful for her. It was good for me um, too. And it was funny because I was, as I was taking my exams and things, part of it, you have to show a video of you uh, and you're supposed to have someone pretend to have dementia. Well, I just took the camera up to where mom was at and just filmed us. It's like, no, this is legit. This is real world right here. You yes. don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was fun. Good luck but, on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It got a little interesting, but mm -hmm. you know what? That's real life. And so having gone through that with three different forms of dementia and then three different living situations, dad in his home, my mother-in-law in mine, my mom in the memory care, and then I got the training. So I have a really well-rounded repertoire to be able to pull from. Mm -hmm. And so I can help caregivers in telling them what the book says, you know, what, what you're trained on, what, what you're going to find when you do your research through the Mayo Clinic or the Alzheimer's Association or wherever you're doing. Um, but I also can tell you, here's some real world things that I did. And, and so consultant is just really just a fancy word for coach. And so what that means for caregivers, I, I do uh, almost exclusively all my caregiver support is via Zoom. And the reason that is, is because I know how hard it is to get your loved one together, get them around and haul them out with you to go somewhere to meet someone. And then you're worried about what they're getting into or what they're doing or what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier for the caregivers to just, you know, pick up your phone. You can be doing whatever. I mean, I've, I've talked to them uh, while their loved one is taking a nap because they usually take a nap at a set time. Um, you know, whatever the case may be, some are watching movies, reading books, doing whatever, but it just makes it a lot more, a lot easier for the caregiver. So they can chat with me. They can tell me what issues they're facing. They can ask whatever questions they want. They can tell me what support they need. I'll help them do the research and find it for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's just there, it, it's whatever they need. I'm just that person that is there that you can say, hey, I'm facing this. Have you seen anything like this? What can I do? And mm -hmm. I can help you. And if nothing else, I guarantee you're always going to be, you're going to leave feeling better than when you came in. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. And you're going to teach them to laugh. Yes, absolutely. That's to laugh about one. it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and stress yeah. reduction techniques. There's a lot of those that I know that are really good ways to step away and reduce that anxiety and help you to think more clearly because mm -hmm. we don't think clearly when we're completely stressed out really i, thought, I know right I burnout would solve that problem right because you're because we're thinking logically it's the whole world that's gone insane <laughs> and while there is some truth to that <laughs> you are so funny i love it so what does an advocate do then is that one step beyond that to help people get like adult protective services in or it's whatever it it's whatever they need. Uh, sometimes like sometimes I have I've had a Zoom call with four different family members on, in different locations mm -hmm. because they did not understand what the caregiver was going through. They didn't understand what was going on and what was happening. So I told them 
what was going on and about the disease and all these things that are a part of the disease and how it was going to get worse. And so they were able to hear it from me, whereas they could not hear it from their sister who was taking care of the mom. Wow. So it's whatever the case, I mean, it can be, I don't put any box on it. I don't put any limits on it. It's if you have a need, then call me and I'll see what I can do to help you. Okay. And so, you know, whether that's, fa- and sometimes that's mediation between families because they can't communicate and they can't, uh, they're just having trouble communicating with each other, having trouble understanding what the greater good is. And, and I've also negotiated between people who were not family members, a, you know, two nieces that were taking care of their aunt uh, mm-hmm. who didn't have any children. And so try to help them, help them come up with a workable solution to take care of their aunt. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So you've covered a lot of ground here, which is (laughs) fantastic. Um, Give us three takeaways that caregivers need to really either um, address for themselves personally or um, where to get support. Okay. Um, First, I would say educate yourself about the disease Mm -hmm. would be number one. And then number two is get support. You cannot do it alone. You need a support system. Um, I, and it's amazing how some people will say, well, I don't have any support. Yes, you do. You just don't know where to find them. Call Mm -hmm. me and I'll help you find them. You know, there, we can, We can do this. And you've got to learn to de-stress and take a little time for yourself so that you can laugh again and find the humor in it. I I took mom to uh, an eye doctor's appointment, mom and my mother-in-law at the same time. And it was a challenge, you know, again, I got one fully dressed and, and sat her down. And then I went to the bedroom to get the other one fully dressed, came back out. And the first one had put her pajamas back on because I left them laying back out on the couch. And she saw the pajamas, so she thought it was time to put them on. And I'm like, ah, okay, so learn from this, get them dressed, hide the clothes, get the second one dressed, you know, but you finally got to the appointment and I'm thinking, okay, looking at the two of them, we made it, we're here, both, they both have their dentures in, they have their glasses on, they're fully dressed. And I look down and my mom is wearing two different shoes. And my first thought was, oh my God, I blew it. I didn't, this is not successful. And then I stopped myself and realized, no, it's okay. She's got another pair of shoes, just like them at home. You know, (laughs) who cares? It's not a big deal. So you've got to take the win, take the win where you find it. And we don't do that enough. And, and then they can call me and for your, for your listeners, um, I'll, I'll, do you want me to go ahead and talk about that? Is that okay? Certainly go right ahead. Okay. Okay. (laughs) All right. Well, well, I, uh, I'll do a free consultation with them. And what we call this one, this is a strategy call. And okay. so it's a 30 minute Zoom call. If they don't want to do Zoom, then we can do the phone, but they can set it up by just emailing me at Deb Compton and the number one at gmail.com. And so they shoot me an email and we'll set up a time to be able to talk talk and if they give me a couple of dates and times that they're available I will do my best to meet their uh, their schedule but then I'll talk to them for half an hour for free just so that they can get an idea of what it is that I do and how I can help them and so there's no risk there's no obligation nothing just someone who has been down the path been down the road that you're on who is willing to help you have an easier time. That's fantastic. I think a lot of caregivers really need to give you a call because you've (laughs) dealt with it with three different people, um, Mm -hmm. your parents and your mother-in-law, and you have the knowledge and the certifications to help someone who is just starting their caregiving journey and have no idea of what to expect. Mm -hmm down the road mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. or the really... person that's halfway down the road and then realizes ah I can't I can't do this and I'm yes you can because I'm very good at encouraging <laughs> because I told you so no I'm just kidding <laughs> just kidding I know um so 
Deb, thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh, um, great information. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your caregiving journeys with us. Um, and I love that 30 minute complimentary caregiving strategy call, just so people can have a clearer idea of what to expect um, and how to get the support and the help that they need. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I didn't even mention, but they can go to my website at thepurplevine.com. And there I have a blog uh, there with helpful articles and they can sign up to get a weekly email that'll give them more information and stuff too. Thank you so much. That's very generous. Um, thank you again for being here and giving us um, great information about how we can survive and thrive in and our thrive. There we go. Yes. Important word in our caregiving journey. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for listening to the Caregiver Cast today. Get a community of support, resources, and strategies for your caregiving journey inside the Caregiver Lifeline community. Visit caregiverlifelinecommunity.com. Get involved with the show. Send your email to mpetrusi2002 at gmail.com. And we'll see you again next week for another episode of Caregiver Cast.